Hello friends, it's time for another turn and today we have to make some difficult decisions, but first let's talk about the arena. So the arena is a mechanic in the game where periodically there is a fight anime tournament arc style battle for some reason, which is an elimination tournament. Every individual nation is invited to send one commander to compete and it is a battle to the death and the winner will receive some kind of useful artifact. Everybody gets to watch all of the matches. It's a useful way to spot how your opponents are equipping thugs and super combatants and so on. But here's the thing, the way it's implemented in the base game means that the items it gives out are absolutely not worth the risk that your commander will die. People occasionally send pointless garbage commanders that they happen to have lying around, which is what happened here today. <laughs> in fact, let's have a look at this. But generally speaking, if you are using the vanilla tournament system, nobody engages with it. Most multiplayer games use one of several mods that rebalance the arena there's there's one that makes it a little bit overpowered and it, the competition becomes very heavy, but there's also uh, a few different mods which just kind of make it so that the items that you win are actually useful and worth using. In a vanilla arena battle, there's basically no point ever in sending a commander, which is why we didn't. In fact, not only are the items granted by the arena frequently worthless, they are, off they are also cursed, which means that you then can't remove them from the unit that has them. As an interesting side note, there are two different versions of the arena. Sometimes the tournament declares that spellcasting is against the rules and it's just about the power that your chassis has and the items they're carrying. But there are also some arena battles which are completely no holds barred, cast whatever spells you like. Anyway, it looks like only two nations sent combatants, so they all clearly had the same opinion I did. We've got some more good slaves. We've also had a lot of battles. We pinged this province to see exactly what was in it. It's not very much. Our wolf riders successfully took a province, but lost their leader in the process, which is irritating, if slightly hilarious. So there are now just 34 random wolf riders standing around in that province with no one to lead them, which is going to be inconvenient for me personally. We've also had two provinces taken back and we've claimed one additional province, again, without any really important forces. Although interestingly, there were 10 Enkidu and one of his Enkidu commanders just randomly in that province that he didn't decide to move out of the way. Maybe he thought I wouldn't go there. We also hilariously have this battle where he sent in a single unequipped commander. This guy doesn't even have any items. Who's wounded as well. What was the point of this? Presumably he thought that he could take this province, but my province defense gives me a hearsay, which can beat this guy by himself. And Additionally, the incredibly weak Zotzes were enough to just put the guy down in one turn. So I don't know what he was trying here. We've, this is the other province that we've lost, which just happened to have some random wolf riders left around who must have retreated from previous battles. And another province that we've taken with our rat bastard teams of wolf riders. I'm probably going to call these tactics ratting a lot because I played a lot of Dota back in the day and rat Dota was a specific style of Dota that involved constant harassing of the enemy lines and just leaving as soon as anyone showed up to deal with you so that you could put pressure on different parts of the map simultaneously and never actually take any losses, which is very much the style of play that I'm going to have to switch to. So you remember that huge army I was worried about last turn? It has split in half. However, it was not smaller than it looked. So he now has two big hefty armies with some pretty decent basic thugs in them. I'm going to have to be pretty careful in how I move. The fact that this one can threaten my capital is a problem, which means that I have to retreat my main army back to my capital. So I'm gonna do it behind this mountain range so that he can't interrupt me. The big question here is where he's going to move, how he's going to move. This army might continue to march on my capital, in which case that's fine. I'm just getting these wizards out of the way so that they don't get in trouble. However, this army could cause some problems. They might march in here to reclaim this forest. They might march here to reclaim this forest. They might march here to try and head off my main army. If I end up having to take a fight with this army, that's not the end of the world, but I don't really want to risk it because I suspect that if within the next couple of turns, he is going to unlock a spell called Soul Slay. He hasn't been casting it in any of the battles I've ever seen yet, but it is a very effective spell to cast against Turbo Communions, and it is a spell he can do because he has a lot of astral magic. Soul Slay targets the strongest units on the battlefield in terms of hit points, and does a vast amount of armor piercing damage to them, provided they fail their magic resistance check. Protection from that is actually why I was moving this Gigia up to, to join the main forces. So her sole role would be to cast anti-magic at the start of the battle to protect against Soul Slay. But I can't get her there in time, and this army, it turns out, is as big as it looked. So I'm gonna have to shift up my tactics. I am still going to be raiding him with Wolf Riders. I've got two units of them who can run around doing stuff at the moment, not counting the mercenaries, who, it turns out, is a wolf rider in command of uh, just scratty 
melee guy is, they're, they're way less good. So we have one unit in here, one unit in here. Because I'm not sure what he's going to do, I'm going to sneak this unit out of here, into here, and maybe take retake this province next turn just to deny resources to the capital again. Because bear in mind, if I control these three provinces, the capital can draw, draw resources only from here, which means that he will not be producing very many things in his capital on that turn, especially since this castle and... well, no, not that one. This castle will be also drawing from that province. So if I can keep dodging his forces and keep these locked down, that would be actually a big problem for him. Regardless, I'm having this group of wolf riders attempt to take this province because, to be honest, I kind of want to uh, block Pangaea out. While Pangaea putting pressure on him is incredibly useful to me, I would much rather Pangaea have to loop round through the north, if at all possible, so that I can safely claim southern provinces. If Pangaea starts moving in through here, he's going to take all of this territory and that's going to be a huge problem for me. Because as much as I want to beat Enkidu, I also don't want Pangaea to get too big. And as you can see, they are growing pretty large already. Unfortunately, this is the province that has got a ton of random wolf guys lying around in it now. It's really frustrating that their leader died because all of the rest of them are fine. This is just really bad luck. It just came down to, you know, the way the battle played out. That wouldn't normally happen. So I am actually recruiting a wolf rider captain in there to take these guys. If he marches either of these armies into here this turn, they're fucked anyway. But if they don't, well, I get to have another... another stealth combat group marching around taking his territories that he doesn't want me to take, especially if I start grabbing these ones at the back so that um, he can't spare the troops to go retake them. But yeah, no, I'm sudden suddenly having to pivot to the defensive, which is not ideal for me. I really did bite off more than I can chew. I've switched everybody back over to research, partly because my thugs won't be mega effective against this nation specifically, although when I fight other nations they'll be very good, and partly because now that I know his army is this big, and that he might threaten my capital, I basically have one hope. If I can get to enchantment level 6, I can get those two spells online at the same time. I can start using Grip of Winter, Rigor Mortis, and a shit ton of skeletons, which will result in everybody on the battlefield going to sleep, except for my skeletons, which will slowly just carve their way through. So if I can combine anti-magic and those two spells, I can basically win any battle with these guys. We've got 1100 research points to go, and we're getting 280 per turn currently, which adds up to about four turns. But you've got to bear in mind that each turn, more researchers will be joining me in my various research provinces. So given that, I think I can hold on. I just need to hold it long enough that I can manage that. I will also, of course, have the opportunity of setting up communions in my capital over the next couple turns, because when this Scratty is here, we will have all of the resources we need to set up a full communion here in the capital, which of course means that all of my mages who are currently researching the cap researching in the capital, if they are under siege until the turn when I get those two spells available, then they can probably bust out and destroy the sieging army using those tactics. Although obviously it would be better if I could get my, my big army back home first anyway. To be honest, if he sees that my army is leaving, he will probably reposition to defend against Pangaea, which will give me, you know, time to get those spells online and then march back into his territory. One of the things I've noticed whenever I play this game is that somehow other nations always seem to have a stronger economy and have therefore both recruited more wizards and more troops. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I started making my castles early enough. I made sure to grab high value provinces as soon as I could. I don't know what I'm doing, what I'm not doing that other players are doing that is giving them the resources to be able to field such large armies and such large numbers of wizards. Although possibly he just hasn't been recruiting very many spellcasters in order to actually field that many soldiers, because bear in mind spellcasters are, you know, five times more expensive than than one foot soldier at a minimum. They're often way, they're often far more expensive than that. So if we do actually look back at these battle reports, we can see that his big army that he is now split into two has one spellcaster. And another spellcaster in two. Oh, his... Hmm, okay, that's frustrating. I didn't realise. His basic commanders are spellcasters as well, so that's two spellcasters in this one, and one, two, three, four spellcasters in this other one. Yeah, so he probably is fielding the normal amount of commanders for Enkidu to be fielding, so I really... I just don't know. I just don't know what I'm doing wrong. It is a total mystery. Anyway, that's my vague plan. Continue to, uh, continue to raid him through rat tactics and get my army home to defend long enough that we can get that combo online, at which point we can probably just put him to sleep and be done with him. So that's everything I want to talk about this turn.
Hello friends, today we're going to prepare to do a war crime. So there have been a lot of battles and very few of them are actually relevant to us so we're not going to bother to watch any of them. It'll honestly be easier just to go over it from the campaign map. We've also had a rare good event that's given us a shit ton of gems and a bit of gold. If you have high luck scaling these things happen all of the time which is extremely useful but we don't. Also worth noting we've had our first actual death of the game, Phlegra has been completely destroyed and I believe that they have been destroyed by Pangaea. The very notable front runner in this game who is currently pushing into Uruk and who sent me messages being like, hey buddy, don't worry, I'll help you fight Uruk. If you can be a distraction, I'll push in from the east. And uh, yeah, so one of the many battles that occurred at the start of this turn was him gazumping me out of a province, which is extremely irritating. He killed an entire unit of my wolf riders and didn't even say sorry and just sent me a bunch of messages like, well, now that I'm here, I can help. Aren't you glad? Yay which is extremely disingenuous and pissed me off a little bit. So my concern is that under the guise of helping me, what he's going to do is just march across here or here, completely like cut me out of Uruk and then just eat up all of Uruk's territory and fight Uruk while Uruk is busy fighting me. That's what I would do in his position. So as you can also see, we've got some trouble going on with Uruk. His capital army has marched out to here, sealing off the retreat of our main army and his me his second half of his main army has cut off our advance. So this army is going to have to take a fight next turn. Unless we just retreat to the east and run around and be a nuisance, but I don't think that's actually going to help us this time. This army absolutely looks like it's about to stand on my capital. An army of giants can knock down fortresses pretty quickly, as those units tend to have a higher siege attack rating rather than, you know, humans. And since he's in position and I look very weak because all I've done is like slap him and then run away, like a, a child on a playground almost, I suspect he thinks that I'm going to be easy pickings, so he'll probably leave this army on my capital to try and take that and then eat up my territory while the rest of his armies go home to defend. And uh, depending on how that happens, the next turn is going to be interesting to see play out. So here are my actual exact predictions. I think this army is going to march south to try and fight this army. I think this army is going to march north to try and fight this army. If that happens, it's random whether the battle will take place in each of these two provinces. If it happens in this province, I'm screwed and these guys are going to die to being sandwiched between these two stacks. But if it takes place in this province, I can beat it, probably. Alternatively, this army might be going to move to here to reinforce the capital guys, or it might move here to try and head off Pangaea and then get back to defend the capital. He has a decent capital defense army here though, which means he might just put this army back on his capital, have this army march here to fight me. In which case, you know, it's it's anyone's anyone's game. We don't know who's going to win that. It's almost certain that this army is going to march on my capital because I have looked so weak. And if that happens, he's going to lose all of it, hopefully, to a plan that I've worked out with my with my mentor, which is essentially mustard gas and trench warfare. So I obviously don't have the troops to fight off his big stack of troops, but you know what? He's not been investing very heavily in mages and I, ha I have been. I have so many fucking wizards you would not believe. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm bringing all of my gigias from my, my two supplementary research outposts and this one who happened to be lying around with a bunch of, bunch of wizards, uh, a bunch of Sabbath slaves, all of them to the capital. They should get in before this battle takes place or more accurately as part of the battle that takes place. And I've scripted them all in such a way that they should be able to join my side perfectly. So what I'm going to do is have a large communion and then an absolute shit ton of communion masters, every single one of whom is going to cast poison resistance on themselves and therefore also the Sabbath slaves. And then my god is going to cast a spell called Foul Vapors. He's the only unit I have currently who can cast it. It's not a not it's an especially difficult spell to cast if you have the right paths, but I don't think he'll be expecting this because the only way that Jotunheim can usually cast foul vapors is on a Scrati, who happens to have randomed the nature path. Because it takes nature and water to cast, and the only way to get nature and water is that uh twenty-five percent chance of having a nature-based Scrati. So if we look at my scripting, all of my guys are set up either to be communion masters who cast Poison Resistance and Horde of Skeletons, and then with a couple of personal buffs mixed in to reinforce the Communion Battery, whose job is to make themselves survive Foul Vapors and also summon a shit ton of skeletons. Because you know what skeletons don't care about? Skeletons do not give a shit about being poisoned. Like, I don't know if you've ever met a skeleton, but those guys will just eat stuff out of the back of the fridge without even checking the sell-by date. So I very carefully scripted them all to... Well, oh god, I forgot to script these guys. Okay, I will take care of that in a moment, but yeah, so... Let's actually look at one where it is working properly. I've carefully scripted them all to be at the back of the of the starting area. 
There's going to be an area here for blood-based mages and an area here for astral-based mages. This is because, and the only reason this plan is going to work, is because the way that blood slaves work is that they spawn into the battlefield as units, and then any blood spellcaster standing close enough can sacrifice them to cast their spells. They do not have to be within the, in the gem inventory of the specific caster. Which means that this one blood hunter over here can step in and fuel all of the other blood mages. Because of the way that things spawn into the battlefield, having them be on the same tile means they'll be randomly displaced into adjacent tiles if there's too much too much meat in one specific tile. Because remember, you can only have six points of meat per tile. Because remember, you can only have ten points of meat per tile, and these guys are big enough that you can't fit two of them in. It's, hang on, shit, is, how big is it? Is it? Must be six, right? One, two, three, four, yeah. Because you can only have six points of meat per tile, and these guys are big enough that you can't fit two of them in. Therefore, if I want them all to be close enough to be able to cast blood spells to the person who is bringing a shit ton of random blood slaves that will just spawn in as units all around, I want those to be grouped up over here, and then the astrals to be grouped up over here, because they can actually just cast um, communion spells on themselves without needing to use the slaves. So then, my god is going to buff himself up, join the communion, protect himself from the poison, and then cast foul vapors which is a battle enchantment, which means it affects the entire battlefield for as long as the caster is alive, or, or until the end of the battle, which continuously does poison damage all across the battlefield. It's incredibly dangerous and can be incredibly effective if you've built your troops the right way. I'm hoping that the poison resistance will be enough to protect my guys enough that they don't all die from the poison, but um, ultimately the goal is going to be that my skeletons will hold the enemy forces back long enough that they will die of poison and then I win. Because he does not have the mage support to cast big poison resistant spells. He's brought barely any mages, which is also why I'm not bothering to protect myself against soul slay just yet, because he's not set up to cast it en masse. But just in case I have added some redundancy, I have a couple of different spellcasters casting regeneration to regenerate all of the Sabbath slaves and so on. So... There's not really anything else to say beyond that. We've got two very important battles that might be about to happen. I am very curious to see what will happen if he does march on my capital. I'm banking on him doing that. I really hope he does that. Otherwise, I'll have to rearrange my troops a little bit and then march outwards. But that might be good for me as well, because it'll give me a chance to consolidate my forces. So without further ado, I think it's time to see what happens. That's all for this turn. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe and share. I also stream regularly on Twitch, and you can find me on Twitter for updates and announcements. If you want to contribute to my continued existence, then why not donate to me on Coffee or Patreon? All of the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching.